on your computer screen should appear Esalen hung on the cliffs of Big Sur with us sitting in a room inside discussing the matter. Bruce Damer. So welcome. Um, this is a very important session for this workshop. Um, I kind of titled this The Deep Dive into Terence McKenna. And what we're trying to do here, because both Lorenzo and I actually have this sense uh, that Terence, when he left, he went somewhere, he went to a kind of a bardo, and he hasn't been released. And this is an attempt to release Terence McKenna from that bardo. And, and to provoke a lot of thought and discussion. And uh, so you'll see what, see what you think, see what you feel about this. So what I'm going to do is read uh, a new, newly re revamped, refis with a new hood ornament, Ode to Terence, which I read the first version of Encierra Madre. And this Ode to Terence was my attempt in, in sort of poetry to summarize his life, and partly in his language. Uh, and it's sort of a veiled reference to a number of, of things that we had researched, that we had found out that really are important for you to understand who Terence McKenna really was and the struggles he was going through. And then I, if I have time, I might read uh, a section of a letter from, from Terence. Uh, I have a very small collection of papers that, that, served, that were not part of the fire that burned his archive. And I might read that uh, as a sort of an appreciation and part of the deep dive. We're going to listen to some excerpts from Terence. There will be excerpts from him describing his youth and his childhood. Because to understand a man, you must understand their, what they went through when they were six years old, eight years old, ten years old. That really is where it's set. Uh, and then uh, a little bit of what was unraveling for him in the 90s. Uh, and then we'll conclude with some love, some soliloquies, love soliloquies from Terence to us where we... We really love you, Terence. You know, why do we love you? Why will we continue to love you? Just listen to these. So without, uh, that was a lot of ado, so I can't say without further ado. Uh, let me take a one last. You'll notice in, in a lot of Terence's talks, he takes, it's the Terence gulp. People have complained about it on the podcast. So this is an ode in five parts and five chapters. Uh, first chapter. Where did you come from, Terence? You youthful seeker of the weird, of course. From circus freak show Fuzzy Charlie to Eros on the tightrope, strutting just out of reach of death in the big top. The big top came to Paonia, by the way. Uh, amazing stories filled your fuzzy head. The best sci-fi the 50s had to offer invaded your mind with mind machines of alien cities flying overhead, on 10-mile diameter Hoover vacuum cleaner covers. As a goggle-eyed nerd kid, you learned the extraordinary discipline of sitting quietly until you could see pictures moving on the back of your eyelids. Seeker of the brilliant, opalescent nature of your Colorado home, you hunted agates, jade, and assorted minerals until one spring you spotted a butterfly, the most astonishing thing you had yet seen. Out in the bay, the psychotropic butterfly flew you to a land be of beheld iridescent machines. The butterfly then vectored you to the tropics on globe-girdling adventures seeking another place never of this world. Hauling 200 pounds of books to the Seychelles Islands for a peaceable read, who else would even remotely consider such a thing? Running scared with your hash through the markets of Bombay, you skirted the dominator's immuno attackers. Finally, parked to the left of the Andes, the Amazon green enfolded your fellowship. You sought black gold, but the elfin shroom bodies of your assigned teacher found you first. Impregnated thus with the adjacent possible, you conjured, conjured a cosmology, an anthropology, an eschatology, a numerology, and a technology that saner people wouldn't dare place their life's poker chips on. <laughs> Two brothers penned an invisible landscape. Two O's cultivated a book on growing the teachers. 
so that they could ensporulate the West. Your funny ideas challenged one too many times, you turned away from science and scientists, instead seeking fellow travelers like John D. Whitehead and others piling up on the pier. In 1982, your ship, the, the good ship, the HMS Philosophical Gadfly, set sail with a full crew complement for ports unknown, tapes set to record. So chapter two, why did we love you when you were here, Terence? Stories flowed and droves came to your sort of theater, an amazing concoction not seen since the shaman's tales of the dream time. In a time of the drought, you courageously promoted a pathway back to the plant experience. Three friends formed a trialogue, and your ideas could be floated in a gentlemanly fishbowl. Your voice soothed us. Your wordage memorized, mesmerized us. Your laugh opened us, so that when your flashlight shone on your take on the overmind, we believed. Your silvery joycy and delivery delivered us whole into the vivid weirdness of your extraordinary mind. Who's to know what you really saw on these trips? What was truly seen in slack-jawed, naked astonishment, and what was later polished shinola for the gods and god the goods of Blarney? Who's to say your mind was not a unique Copernican instrument, piling, piloting novel, invisible landscapes at the cosmic edge? Omega, Esalen, and other one-worded places beckoned as the gadfly grew into the guru, no matter your abhorrence of the latter. Chapter 3. How did you fare, Terence? In the 1980s, dark thunderheads announced their throaty arrival, yet your course stayed ever truer, to your sense anyway. By 1990, business got scary, your marriage dissolved, and your teacher gave you a frightful licking one night. Terence the teacher, enough of the dancing mice. Show me what you are for yourself. Brackets, black draperies lift, organs tone, and the awning infinite cracks open. Teacher to Terence, why did you turn away? Enough of the other. It's time for a dose of self, yourself. The teacher turned on Terence, and he never again returned. Instead, Terence launched on a dubious decade, telling ever taller tales, touting adventures on five to seven dried grams, while living in fear of these very plant medicines. Language in the mind got you all the way to the domed vestibule of the elves, my friend. But as the shamans taught, it is the humble heart that opens the inner sanctum, completing the true hero's journey to healing and wholeness. Shinola shifts to shit, and the existential crisis accelerates. Dennis to Terence, is it time to pause for a reevaluation? Terence hits the gas on his forward escape as integrity entered the rearview mirror. It was now the story that was the thing. The blue morpho shudders his wings. The psychedelic light flickers and dies. Ramdas to Terence, your life is your message. Terence to Ramdas, my life is a mess. My message is my message. <laughs> Nominated as the altered statesman, anointed by the good Dr. Leary, and books flying off the presses, your trajectory arced high. Bills to pay and a web to be woven, your public persona had you in its grasp and kept you white-knuckled, gripped on the wheel, navigating into ever less chartered waters. A date in 2012 lay shimmering on screen as Time Wave Zero Code came to life but it was destined to languish in the bardo of scientific non-falsifiability. I'll explain that later. 
your fellow trial loggers one day drew a line in the sand as the stories started to drag anchor. Ralph to Terrence, that is a paranoid fantasy. Overtoning made you into a performer and you gloriously peaked in late 98. But by then your personal singularity was barreling toward you. You began to experience dreams that were unenglishable. And for you, this is really saying something. By early 99, we saw the fatigue of too many trips, this would be airplane trips, uh, inscribed in your face. And unbeknownst to us, you were heading for one more encounter with the teacher. On the eve of your concrescence, I was honored to guide you as Avatar Zone Ghost to take a dip into the language-built virtual worlds of cyberspace, your last taste of tech novelty. Chapter 4. Where did you go, Terence? The teacher announced its return one cruel day in May. The doctor's ironic observation on the shroom shape of your tumor kicked off your descent into the ultimate experience of novelty. Y2K and your surgeries came and went without a hitch, so the end of the world fell from favor, but you still had your date with the forward escape. On April 3rd, your final boundary dissolution was at hand and almost too late. Mind disintegrating, your heart forced its way open, gifting you the ultimate wisdom of the teaching plants, and of this and any world, it's all about love. So, Terence, <laughs> teller of Irish tales, we love you. We are still here. It's 2012, and in some sense, your year. And yes, we kept breathing. But where did you go? Did you end up so stuck in the muck, the transcendental object could not even pull you out? Did the mushroom wave come for you 10 miles wide and sweep you away? Did the saucer ship pick you up on the pier and ply the star matrix to the elf and Grey Haven's luxury condo complex? In a dream with you in 99 in Hawaii, I saw you unfold yourself and step into an elf piloted, plush seated, bejeweled Fabergé egg, which carried you up through the azure veil. When told of this vision, you said, Ah, the getaway car. Chapter 5, we have brought you back, Terence. Years later in dreams, you returned to me and to others in many guises. An electrical short, or the elves, or whatever, took your archives from us in the fire of 07. So Lorenzo and I and many others got, got going and got together in a project to put you back together and make sense of the whole. Piece by piece, the psychedelic bard McKenna was reconstituted in cyberspace. So now we look back, and if your journey was only partially completed, your business left unfinished, and yourself half-baked, what is left? What the heck? Today we summon you back to life here at Esalen, a place in which you were beloved, held court in yurts, hot tubs, yawn, lawns, and big houses. Before you departed, we were planning a workshop together in this very place so I could return and do them myself, so you said. Michael Murphy and Nancy Lunny said, do it, so here we are. Then what if you is left, Terrence? What if your wraps, your recipes, your theories, your life lessons, your missteps, what is there left that goes beyond 2012? So Terrence, that is what this is all about, so help us out. Don't be afraid. We are your faithful, and we now know the true rap. So come on in the door. Take your place. For Terrence, we are here to remember you, to revivify you, to appreciate you, and to release you. The spell is now broken, Terrence. So if the truth can be told as to be understood, it will be believed.
So I'm actually going to put the very voice. These, this is where Terence lives now, in cyberspace. So I'm going to I'm going to put him here, and we're going to what we're going to do is hear about the, the, these first four recordings are his childhood in Paonia and up to his first trip. And I don't know if you, you've ever heard this. So this was recorded at the Ojai Foundation back in the early 90s under the teaching tree, if any of you were there at that time. But um, this will kind of give you an idea of that this man, he had an absolutely unique mind. And the unique mind was from birth, from his Irish heritage, from his neocortex structure, something like that. But he also trained for this job. He really trained from a very early childhood. And if you listen to this, uh, you'll, you'll see, you'll see wh- how it went together. So are we ready? We're good? I never imagined that I would end up sitting in this position and pontificating on the nature of life and history and global human destiny. My interest in fossils, I remember I had an uncle who gave me a book when I was about eight years old of fossils, and it had one of those charts in the front of it where it shows uh, five billion years, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column. And so I saw that human history was a hairline crack at the bottom of the column furthest to the right. And I got the concept of how old, not the universe, but the earth is. And it was a dizzying perspective. And then I had an uncle who was an old rock hound, and he introduced me to the concept of uh, not splitting apart strata to see ancient forms of life, but slicing rocks up and polishing them to reveal the light and the color and sometimes the crystal cavities that were hidden inside them. And so very early on, I got this idea that the surface of things is not where attention should rest, that uh, you have to, as uh, Ahab tells Starbuck in Moby Dick, you have to seek the little lower layer, and under the surface of things is uh, another reality a reality that reaches, in some cases, back to the birth of the planet. Around this time, there began to be alarmist uh, articles in the press about the abuse of blue morning glory seeds by some of the more uh, crazed and unassimilated members of uh, American society. And I immediately tore out and purchased a couple of packets of Blue Morning Glory seed, and uh, and uh, and then noticed that uh, the leaves imprinted in the fabric of the drapes in the living room all seemed to have little faces that were <laughs> dancing. This was, in fact, clearly the intent of the designer, but something that in all all the years of living around these ratty drapes, I had never <laughs> noticed. And then I began to look at everything around me and discovered that this affinity for looking into things, that my rock hunting, butterfly collecting uh, habits had instilled in me, had become like turbocharged and swimming in the depth of polished stones, ponds, the ditch running down the back of the backyard were myriads of worlds. And I went outside and I was looking around at everything 
and then I, I just felt physically overcome. My knees basically gave way underneath me, and I sat down under a tree, and I closed my eyes. And my life has never been the same since, because there, waiting behind closed eyelids, were, uh, you know, ruined cities covered with creeping jeweled lichens and uh, inhabited by shining-eyed creatures that were, I was not sure exactly what, and much, much more. And I just spent a half hour or so literally in trance gazing into this unfolding reverie of deserts, jungles, machines, archaeological artifactria, machines in orbit around alien worlds, all of this stuff. And uh, I was stunned. I still am stunned. And that essentially set the compass for my, uh, the rest of my intellectual life. I didn't understand really what had happened. In other words, I didn't clearly get it that this was a trip and that it was induced by the psychedelic. I understood something of that, but I thought also it must be unique. It must be my mood, my expectation. Or surely this cannot happen on demand through the simple act of eating morning glory seeds being sold at 35 cents a pack down at the hardware store. Um, and so then I began to ask questions, and I quickly discovered it was a mistake. So I went to Huxley and read more carefully, saw that he was working from the early of Havelock Ellis, Weir Mitchell, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow. Uh, it turned out that this whole tradition albeit an underground tradition in Western intellectual or aesthetic sense, based around the perturbation of consciousness with substances. So this is his formative experience. This is age 14, 15, before they, he moved out to Berkeley. And this is in Paonia, you know, where you could buy... Blue Morning Glory Seeds for 35 cents a pack at the hardware store. But you can see in here his whole, his whole cosmology, his whole worldview, his, his structure of his life just came to him, including the fact that he had been reading Huxley and he'd been starting to read. You know, this man read so much by the time he was 15. He'd done his 10,000 hours in this stuff. So then he went back into history. Who, who studied this before? How did they write about it? So you can see Terence McKenna formed whole at age 14 or 15. This is why in, when, in his late 20s, when he comes out and does that first conference, he's, when you hear his earliest talks, and I think Lorenzo would agree with this, it's the full Terence. There is no maturing Terence or immature Terence. It is, it is there. And there's one very early... Uh, recording from 82 that we suspect was done in someone's home because we hear screaming kids and it might have been Finn screaming, we don't know. But basically somebody put a microphone in front of him and said, do the UFO thing. You know, we're going to record it. And and even that primordial early recording is a fully formed Terrence, fully formed mind, uh, beautiful presentation. You know, everything is there. And in fact... There are a lot of things in the earlier recordings that disappear in the later ones. That you, you can mine his earlier work for new ideas, and that's rare in, a, in an intellectual. Next, I'm going to play, and these will have to be cranked up a little bit. So in the ode, this is a kind of an unraveling of the ode for you um, to sort of interpret it. Uh, this is from a, a famous... Trial. Well, they're all famous, but the trialogue of 1998 at UC Santa Cruz. And in the movie yesterday, you could see the picture of Ralph and 
Rupert and Terrence on stage, that's from that trialogue from UC Santa Cruz. And this is where, and I, I've spoken with Ralph about this event. This is where both Rupert and Ralph said, enough. We're drawing the line in the sand. This stuff has just become elaborated and elaborated and elaborated over the last 10 years and to the point where we just can't really entertain this anymore. And so this is where they kind of, in a gentlemanly fishbowl, they start to do this. And poor Terrence is so caught off guard. But then, of course, he recovers beautifully and tells a joke and whatnot. But this is where he, his best buddies were saying, we're not buying it anymore. So let's, let's let, give a listen to this. If I'm right, we may be in the first few years of an endless prosperity because our machines, our models, and the data those machines need is now of such high quality that there won't be crash-bust, crash-bust cycles. Now, you can pick up the newspaper tomorrow and prove me wrong, but this thing has already Not prove you wrong today. outlived itself. Yeah. <laughs> you say. <laughs> and computers will be built in these realities. Virtual computers will be the source of the AI. Not real hardware, but virtual hardware running virtual code in virtual realities. And in that domain, well, maybe, but that's, can design that's a complete uh, fantasy. As a matter of fact, all the machines that we've seen today require maintenance by a human on a daily basis. The software requires maintenance. The hardware requires maintenance. The parts simply wear out. There are moving parts. Well, Virtual the reality... seen as one machine was built to be indestructible. The AI will not be located it's on a CPU. It will be a distributed intelligence. If 14 people worldwide, the right 14 people, decided to stop repairing it, the World Wide Web would go down in three days. I'm glad that we have arrived now at the field of science fiction and fantasy and that we can speak about uh, alternative futures which is the true gist of science fiction and fantasy and uh, this is one possible future and I think it's a really paranoid one in which the alien is a, <laughs> a dangerous uh, enemy. I've heard different McKenna versions of this controlling intelligence over the years and this is the first time I've heard it embodied in the internet. I mean, I agree that... <laughs> I mean, it, was, it took different forms. In last time we talked, I think it was a hypothetical time machine that would invade from the future and cause a, a collapse of normal human cognitive boundaries where the machine elves, the DMT experience, etc., would take over in a meltdown of human consciousness. In that too! <laughs> Terence, one point, I don't, you've probably got an answer for this, um, and if not, you'll soon think of one. But I, so, I think it's trickier than you think, and harder to corner me than you may suppose. Well, no. <laughs> All right, well, that was a mere comment on your aside about 20 years. I never expected to hear that phrase from you, but I now realize that uh, there are such complexities layered in that. Well, I have to build in trapdoors because we're getting closer and closer. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing about this is that life, therefore, can be digitally defined every day up in Silicon Valley. There are people who go happily to work uh, laboring on what they call the great work and the great work, as defined by these people, is the handing over of the drama of intelligent evolution to entities sufficiently intelligent to appreciate that drama. And they all are what we might mistake for home appliances, uh, if, if we weren't paying attention. Uh, 
it's been observing, it's been watching, it's been designing, and wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the occasion of the millennium were the occasion for it to just step forward on the stage of human awareness and say, I am now with you. I am here. I am the partner you never suspected. And here's the kind of world I think we should move forward. Well, I think we're on the cusp. I agree with you. I think in five years, if we sit down and have this conversation, either you will agree with me effortlessly, or I will agree with you effortlessly. By that time, it will be clear. Either there will have been catastrophic wars in Asia, the enormous collapse of economies spreading misery to millions of people, or the firm hand of these new global electronic modalities will have been exposed and people will uh, be living in a, in a world of, as you say, rosy expectations. We're in the narrow neck. This is the heat of battle. The fog of war has descended upon us here at the millennium. But by 2002, 2003, it will be clear that we have, that the bifurcation has gone one way or another. In spite of the fact that it seems very contentious down here on the stage at the moment, in a way I have a feeling it's an artificial setup for guys like us. The name of the game is to just be a little bit of ahead of everybody else on the curve so that we can perform our function as profit. But you want to be a prophet, not a false prophet. But the danger comes uh, with the ambition, and there's no way to tease them apart except to live into the future. Now we're going to go into the deepest of the deep dive, and we're going to hear a short, uh, very noisy uh, telephone interview, Peter Gorman interviewing uh, Dennis McKenna, Terrence's brother, in 1993. And uh, I probably took the noisiest version, I'm sorry. <laughs> and in this, and this is 1993, his brother, and actually if you read the, the forward to Invisible Landscape, to this edition, his brother's already basically saying, listen, you know, take this all with a grain of salt, what happened at La Chere, we've we were kids, we've grown up, etc., etc. Uh, but this is where Dennis is starting to come out. And, and this is all in the public. Uh, it's all... You know, uh, it was for the special issue, and it's been out, you know, 15, 16 years. But uh, we'll have to turn the volume down a bit. But this is where the unraveling is sort of coming, starting with Dennis. Guy who can pack the houses every time, I feel, has a larger responsibility to the psychedelic community to refrain from making these completely off the wall comments, you know, and to actually tell us like it is, not how he imagines it to be. And, and uh, you know, of course, the other side of it is people go to hear the off-the-wall comments. That's what they're there to hear. I think people should view it as theater and not as, you know, someone pronouncing truth necessarily. I mean, I, I'm sure that Terrence views it as theater. You know, I can't believe that he takes what he says seriously. I mean, I can tell you that he doesn't. Much of what he says, he says it because it's going to get a rise out of somebody. You know, he's always been that way. I mean, you know, never let the fact, never let the fact get in the way of a provocative statement. You know, I mean, the provocative statement is the important thing. If the facts happen to disagree with it, well, then you know, we'll just ignore those. It's kind of like Murphy's Law, you know. I think, or not Murphy's Law, but one of those similar uh, laws of science, you know, that people say jokingly, if, if the facts fail to agree with the theory, they must be disposed of. And that's sort of Terence's approach to these things. <laughs> Which I think is unfortunate, actually, because the, the story itself is far out enough. You know, you don't really have to distort the facts or invoke... Uh, you know, elf machines from Dimension X to make it far out. And I think something came up this morning, just to sort of wrap this up. It sort of ties the the vision that I had when I wrote the ode together with the, this piece here was 
And it's something that we've sort of seen and talked about over the years. Um, so in 88 or 89, Terence came up against that, that door, other self, and turned away from the door, heart closed. A lot of things were happening in his life at that time that probably made this exquisitely difficult for him, this one particular mushroom trip. So if one was to think of the mushroom as, as an entity, as an intelligence, especially so engaged with Terence, it was his teacher, it found him in La Chirera. That mushroom, you know, he's a lifetime sufferer of migraine headaches. And you think, my sister died of a very massive brain tumor when she was 31. And so I went through this in the family, this brain tumor the size of a grapefruit kind of a, a thing, which I think Terence was in that class. But when he went, he, he went to the hospital in Honolulu, the surgeon came out and said, you're going to find this ironic but look at the shape of this tumor. And it was clearly the shape of a mushroom. So at breakfast this morning, we were having a, a little talk and it sort of popped into our heads that, you know, if the mushroom could not get this man's heart open in the way that it is used to doing, which is to throw you into the bardo and into into the terror until you crack, until you, you the only place you can reach for is love, which he... He couldn't, he couldn't grasp in 1988. It was going to do this for him. And the way it did this was it grew inside his mind. And it consumed... Now, understand, we saw him... Something that is, is remarkable. He started doing overtoning, and he performed with Lost at Last. In late 98, we, we saw him in Santa Cruz, and we saw him in San Francisco. You might have seen him those performances. He was so much the elf. When he hit that performer's thing, it was almost like Terence was sort of completing. That was his eschaton. That was his moment. That was his singularity, those performances. In my mind, when I, when I watch the video that survives of, of that, and he is just completely unbridled. He's, it's not about the head. He's just, he's, he's wailing. He's singing. He's, he's really going. It's not the mind anymore. Well, at that time, this tumor was massive. Can you imagine? He's... He's doing this kind of performance with an incredibly large glioblastoma in his mind. I watched my sister be functional uh, with a very massive tumor. In fact, her voice, her speech center moved from one hemisphere.